Testing, 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 too loud. Little bit of a vibration. Testing, that's better. Good morning. A very warm welcome to everyone who has gathered today, both in person and online. Glad to be together today. I want to encourage you to uh, read the announcements that you received by email last Friday. And um, there's some announcements in there about summer, and we're closing for a few weeks this summer for worship. So please uh, read those, and there are copies of those at the back if you don't um, have an ability to, to check your email at home. 
there's also an announcement in there about uh, Korean United, and they have, after some discussions um, between us and Korean United and also with Prairie du Pine Region, they are going to be ending their contract um, here in this location on June 30th, 2023. Did everyone see that announcement? And I, I want to know if there were any questions or comments about that today. Um, and any moment from the board, feel free to jump in if you like um, and answer these questions. Right now, Ed, they, it, they're deciding if they're going to close as a congregation. They've become small enough that they, they aren't able to financially sustain their space here anymore. So that's why they're ending the contract. It's not that they're going somewhere else. So... COVID was really hard on them, and um, there hasn't been any Korean immigration in the last couple of years, and that's where they draw a lot of their new folks from. So right now, they're deciding what their future will be, but they won't be able to pay a full-time minister. So, yeah, Bonnie. Well, that's, um, that's a really good question in that, the, you know, the, the leadership team decided that we'd announce this now, and then come September, we hope to have struck a subcommittee to start looking at that. So they do contribute, um, I mean, there are partners, there are friends, I mean, we've spent 11 years together, 12 maybe. Um, so it's, and there's the issue of the rent, of course. So we will be, we will need to decide if we're going to look for a new partner, um, if we want to make up that money in other ways. Sort of throw everything on the table, take an opportunity to just look at uh, what we want to do in that regard. So we, we feel really, really fortunate that we have a year to say goodbye to each other you know, to Korean United, we, they're not just suddenly gone, and that we also have a year to decide what we want to do, what, how we can um, find a new partner or whatever we choose. So, yeah. Any other comments or questions? Yeah, you know, really, in any way you can support Korean United folks, this is a very difficult time for them. As you know, they just celebrated 50 years in ministry. They were the first Korean United, first Korean church in Winnipeg. So this is a really, really big deal for them. So, Okay, and Wayne, I think we have a recital in here at one o'clock today, don't we? Oh, at three. Okay, so that's too late. So we won't be setting up chairs for that, but it's a recital for about 150 people. Okay. Anything from you, Arlene? Thank you, Arlene, and thanks to the choir. This uh, today is the last time the choir meets before, um, yeah, for the summer and then till the fall. Please join me in the call to worship. Your words are printed in the orange print. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Love is our salvation and justice our cause. The Spirit sets us for and we pray. Christ who knows us by name. These days call us to live courageously in the midst of fear. 
Give us wisdom when we encounter the fears of others. Give us patience when we encounter our own fear. Give us perseverance to long for the freedom which is our birthright. May this worship time bolster our hopes and comfort our fears, that we might be strengthened by our faith, power, and collective courage. Amen. And we stand for a wonderful, big, and joyous opening hymn. One of my favorite lines from that song is, hearts unfold like flowers before you. As we enter into the silence today, you are invited to ponder that line and to consider when have you felt your heart unfold like a flower.
Our first reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face toward Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village to make ready for him. But the villagers did not receive him, because his face was set towards Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command the fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. As they continued along the road, someone said, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have holes, and birds in the air have nests, but I have nowhere to lay my head. To another, Jesus said, Follow me. They answered, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus replied, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another one said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those in my home. Jesus said, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Our second reading this morning come from Paul, comes from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 5. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of servanthood. For you, uh, for you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Not uh, Only uh, do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become servants to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. These are the readings. May our ears hear and may our hearts be led to understanding. What are you all staring at? <laughs> Think no one ever wore a backpack to preach a sermon before. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can certainly start by telling you that Arlene and I feel a bit burdened down by today's scripture readings. Let us begin with prayer. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts create greater light and love in the world. Amen. Beloved of God, the journey that you just heard about in the gospel lesson the journey that Jesus embarked upon with his disciples was a learning journey. Today's scripture was a learning journey for me as well. And sometimes when I'm having trouble learning things, I need to give myself an awful lot of object lessons. So I have brought a backpack full of object lessons today. As I move through the scripture reading, try to break it down in a way that helped it make sense for me, I thought I'd share some of these things with you. You also have some 
uh, see some things on the table already that I have set up. One of the hard things about the gospel lesson is it's so packed. It's packed with these amazing quotes, these uh, disc seemingly disconnected sayings. And when you look at it a little more deeply, one also realizes that there are numerous, quote, numerous references back to the Hebrew scriptures. And when I say Hebrew scriptures, um, remember that's just another way of saying Old Testament. But the Jewish folks don't really appreciate that reference. And it's uh, a little more honorable to say the Hebrew scriptures. So when I use that phrase today or any time, I mean the scriptures that have been and are um, holy writings for the Hebrew people. And of course, we incorporated them in the, in the whole Bible. So... Let's begin. Let's begin to unpack the knapsack by looking at what our text says. So the first thing, the first thing that we see in the scripture reading is that Jesus sets his face toward Jerusalem. Now, this is a very well-known, well-used phrase in Jesus' day. To set one's face towards a thing or a place or a task means that you are firmly on the path. So, To help me remember that, I've got a picture of Jesus and one that I really like because he, he looks a little bit like a Jewish man in this, in, this, uh, in this picture. We have a picture of Jesus setting his face, looking towards something. And that's what was happening here. He was heading towards Jerusalem with his scriptures or with his disciples and nothing was going to turn him aside. And we're using that as an object lesson because this is the first reference to a Hebrew text. Everybody who heard that in the Gospel of Luke knew that Jesus was referring back to a much older story when certain people set their face towards a city and bad things happened there. So when we read that simple line in the Gospel lesson, that's just a big clue that things are not going to go well for Jesus in Jerusalem. So they're on the road, Jesus and the disciples, and they need somewhere to stay for the night. That's where our next object lesson comes in. Our reading told us that Jesus sent two messengers ahead of the rest of the group to secure lodging and food for the evening. And if, um, if you know what the, the Middle East would have looked like then, the towns weren't on the route, but they were usually off to the side, and sometimes you had to kind of climb around a hill to get up into those little, those little protected towns. And so you couldn't just go through the town and see if there was a place to stay. You had to make an effort, sometimes a kilometer or two, to just go and see about lodging and food. So we sent messengers ahead to do that. And this is our second reference to a Hebrew story. There was a point where God sent messengers ahead to a village and they were not welcome there. So Jesus' messengers go to a village and they were not welcomed. So how should we um, depict that today? So objects of hospitality, food and drink, are overturned. They're not available in that village. 
Jesus and the disciples were not welcomed. That's our second reference to a Hebrew lesson. Now, there's lessons within lessons in this gospel reading. So I'm going to give us a little lesson about the Samaritans, because the village that they wanted to stay at was a Samaritan village. And for those of us in the modern day, that was the village in the West Bank. And the Samaritan people were Jews, but not the same kind of Jews as Jesus. They adhered to a much older form of Jewishness, and they had very different practices. For example, they didn't believe that people should take an annual pilgrimage to Jerusalem. They thought that this was a bad thing because God wasn't in Jerusalem. God was everywhere, and especially God was in all of the local nature sites where God had been spotted in the old, old times. So the Samaritans did a very interesting thing. When people passed through their village looking for hospitality when they were on their way to Jerusalem, the Samaritans said, no hospitality for you. And they said it for religious reasons. Now everybody in those days knew that if you were going through a Samaritan village on your way to Jerusalem, you wouldn't get hospitality. They weren't being particularly mean to Jesus and the disciples. This is the same treatment everybody would have received. Interestingly, when pilgrims were on their way home from Jerusalem, you could enter the same village and get hospitality. That's just a little Samaritan thing that's buried in the text today. But it's there for many reasons. One reason is there was no hospitality for Jesus, and this is an indication of things to come. It's also an indication that the Samaritans, like everybody else, didn't understand what Jesus was doing in Jerusalem. He wasn't going there like any other old pilgrim to just pay money and worship at the temple. He was going there to turn things upside down. So they didn't understand. We come to our next little teaching. James and John, when they've been refused hospitality in the village, say to Jesus, Shall we call fire down upon their heads to destroy them? And Jesus rebukes them. But this fire, this image of fire, is another reference back to Hebrew scripture, where prophets of old used to do that. And it, apparently it was God-inspired, but the old prophets called fire down from heaven, and they destroyed people, they destroyed animals, they destroyed villages. So our reference for that is these Jenga blocks, and I get to do a fun thing. That is to help us remember that Jesus was a new kind of prophet. He was destroying the old kind of prophet. And he rebused the disciples, which means you have completely failed to understand what I am about. You don't understand the spirit I come from. I don't come to destroy lives. I come to build lives up. So first the Samaritans don't understand what Jesus is about, and then the disciples don't. So all of these things are building, building elements in our story. And there's something in here, something kind of hidden. Jesus is indicating that there's more than one kind of spirit in life. They're the spirits of destruction. You can just destroy everything you don't like. There's the spirit of life. And Jesus is asking people to see that this is the road they're on. They're about the spirit of life. So we're halfway done, and now we have three encounters. Again, these were, these, this is a story. There's no way that all of these things happened on this journey, but we have three encounters, and all of them reference a Hebrew passage. The first encounter. Someone approaches Jesus' group on the path. They recognize Jesus, and they say, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replies with this beautiful, kind of sad and poetic image, foxes have dens, birds of the nest, 
birds of the air have nest, but I, the son of man, I have no place to lay my head. Now, I think we've heard that. Most of us have heard it. I mean, Arlene and I pondered this as we talked about it on Tuesday, what these lessons meant for us. And I think, I think I've heard many sermons that Christians have taken this to mean that following Jesus will take us out of security. We will have no permanent dwelling place, no fixed dwelling. But it references a, a very sad passage in the Book of Lamentations, where a temple, a sanctuary has been destroyed. And when a sanctuary is destroyed, foxes and birds set up lodging there. So if you've ever been in an, in an old abandoned building, I know I used to love to do that on Sunday afternoons, drive around, look at abandoned buildings, and there'd always be birds in the, in the, in the rafters. So the reference to birds and foxes suggests that the temples of the world are destroyed, that to lodge in them means that we are a part of death. And Jesus is indicating that the true sanctuary, the new sanctuary, is actually the human being themselves. We are the new sanctuary. We are the walking church. And so for that, I'm, I've got a little nest here. And the only bird I had in my house was this little owl. And we know the owl doesn't sit in the nest necessarily, but there's the little owl in the nest to remind us of that reference back to the Hebrew Bible. So we have four. Jesus sets his face. There's no hospitality. Jesus isn't the kind of prophet that destroys. And we are like the fox and the bird. But we're invited to not be the fox and the bird. Don't be the people that stay in destroyed dwellings. Another one, a fifth reference. Somebody comes along and Jesus says to him, follow me. And the person says, first, let me go and bury my father. And Jesus gives a very clever reply, let the dead bury their own dead. So here, here are references quite um, countercultural. And for that, I brought something that sits in my office. The urn. Let the dead bury their own dead is a reference back to another Hebrew Bible, Hebrew book. And it reminds us that if you are spending your time on the dead, you are dead as well. Now, the Gospel of Luke reminds us that Jesus, um, we know that Jesus uh, wasn't, Jesus isn't always uh, portrayed as consistent in the Bible, but there's a couple areas where he's always consistent. He's always consistent when it comes to money. He's always consistent when it comes to death. And Jesus had no time to spend on death. He was not interested in it. And he did not think it was a good thing to conduct big rituals and to spend money on death. Very countercultural then, and it's countercultural today. Jesus reminds us, if you are spending all your time on death, you yourself are of the dead. You are the walking dead. And then there's one last reference, one last encounter on the road. Someone comes to Jesus and says, I will follow you, Lord, but first, let me say farewell to those at home. And Jesus says, no one who puts their hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. So for that, I've brought a stole, and this is the stole that I wear for sacraments. You saw me wear it last week. And it's supposed to symbolize that a Christian minister wears a yoke around their neck, just like the old yoke that used to 
hook farmers up to a plow so that you could plow and have stability. And so this is to remember that we are, um, we are always yoked to, the, to Christ. So I'll put it here. So Jesus teaching about the plow. This is a reference back to a Hebrew story where a man is plowing a field, and as he plows a field, he is invited to leave his work and go become a prophet for God. In that story, the man also says, just let me finish plowing the field. And the reply is, sure, come along when you're ready. So a very different reply. Strangely, the man does stop plowing the field. He takes his wooden yoke that's fastened to the plow, takes it home, burns it on the fire, creates a big meal for his family, gives him the meal, and then he goes off and follows God. What could this mean for us? What could Jesus have meant by referring to this story? Jesus is saying, put your hand on the plow, take it home, and burn it, so that when you are tempted to go back to your old way of life, your old way of life won't be available to you anymore. Very interesting to me. When Jesus spoke, and in the Jewish tradition, people were always referencing back to the time when they were slaves in Egypt. And so this yoke has reference there too. The people wanted to be free, but as soon as they were free, they talked about how good they'd had it when they were slaves in Egypt. And so Jesus in this reference is simply saying, burn the old life completely so that you can never go back. My knapsack, carried things that are difficult for me to understand. There are so many lessons here, and I hardly know how or why or if they apply to us. But I think one message that's clear here is that we are not just to take a pilgrimage to a holy place. We are to become the holy place. We are to put behind us anything of death and become utterly alive in the spirit of Jesus, alive in the prophetic spirit beyond anything that's been seen or imagined before. We are to be the living sanctuary in the world when all the physical temples and churches have been destroyed. We are to be the freedom, and we are to be the new thing. And in closing, I want to read again the text that Bill did so well earlier, the one from Galatians. So listen again. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit to a yoke of servanthood. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become servants to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. May God give us understanding. Praise be to God. Amen. I have decided to follow Jesus.
John has asked me to speak to you this morning on what stewardship means to me. When she asked me, she doesn't, didn't tell me that she was going to be a very hard act to follow. I don't have any props up here. <laughs> anyway, thank you for your lovely message, Don. Anyway, what stewardship means to me? To me, it means giving, sharing of your time, your talent, and your financial resources. Thinking back on the subject, I, to me, I think stewardship first entered my life when I was probably between the ages of five and 10. Uh, my parents were fairly active church goers. Uh, my dad sang in the choir, my mom was the explorer leader, and they gave me the opportunity of coming to church regularly. Of course, as a five or seven year old, I wasn't interested in sitting in the congregation with everybody else, so I would go to Sunday school. Uh, my interest was, was uh, um, increased as I was doing that because they used to give awards. If you had perfect attendance, first of all, you got a little badge for a year's perfect attendance. Then the next year, if you did it, they gave you a little medal to pin below the badge. And I was going, and I was about 10 years old, I guess. We lived in Brandon at the time. And Brand the recreational area for Brandon was Clear Lake. My dad was quite a hard worker, so he worked six days a week. So Sunday was always a special day for the family, and we would go off and do things. So this Sunday was planned that we were going up to Clear Lake to have a family picnic. Well, that's when I put my foot down. I said, look, we can't go to Clear Lake until I go to Sunday school because I want my badge this year. So <laughs> anyway, that's when stewardship started for me. And as I, I think I was about 19 or 20, I just started working. And I said to my parents, I said, you know, all those years of going to Sunday school, I've got to give back. So here I was just out of my teens, uh, enjoying life, a, a high social circle, but every Sunday morning I taught Sunday school. I did this for a couple of years, and I can distinctly remember a couple of those mornings I didn't prepare beforehand, and I didn't get in till three the night before, so. <laughs> but anyway, we had a great time, and, and that's when I started to give back. And I don't give back because of a feeling of obligation. I give back because of a feeling of want, wanting to do something and to help others. And I know I'm probably speaking to the, the reformed here when I, because you're all, I see your faces all the time, you're always involved in everything. And I encourage you to continue to do that. For those of you out in, in uh, technology land, uh, I encourage you as well. Uh, it comes down then near the, at the end of the day to keep these, this building open, to keep our wonderful staff employed, we require money. The summertime is always a lean time of year for money, uh, which is normal because people are away, they're at the lake, they're doing, they're traveling, whatever. So keep your contributions coming forward. You probably read in the bulletin, uh, for five weeks, the church is basically going to be closed. Uh, Cindy will be in the office a couple of days a week, but keep your contributions coming. Uh, I think it's Tuesdays and Wednesday for a couple of hours each day that Cindy's in. You can drop your check off to, uh, into the office or mail it in. The mail will be picked up regularly. So keep the cash flow going. Uh, Blake shared with me some, some numbers to the end of May, and I was quite encouraged. The numbers are looking really good, but we're going into uh, June, July, and August when things will slow down. So anyway, I just encourage you all to continue to give back and to give to the church in all ways as I like to do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. I'm wildly curious to know when you didn't plan for your Sunday school and you went there tired, what, what'd, you, what'd you do with them? Oh, yes. Right on. 
Good stuff. Thank you so much, Bill. It's great to know a little more about you and your faith journey. There are offering plates at the back. Um, it, is, uh, it is an honor to be part of this congregation and to contribute both to its well-being and to, um, to projects around the world. Let us pray. Living Christ alive in us, free our spirits of any kernel of revenge and cruelty. Direct us toward repair and right action. When we slip into apathy or despair, gaze upon us and bless these offerings as a hard-earned hope toward everyday resurrection. Amen. Let us turn ourselves toward prayer at this time, and um, if there is something that you want to raise up, that you want to speak out loud, please do that. There will be silences for that. Gracious, generous, loving God, we come to you with all the possibility of this day opening before us. We give thanks for space and time to be with friends, family, to read a book, to tend a garden, to visit, to just be. We give thanks, O oh God, for the many blessings of summer, community events, street fairs, farmers markets, meeting others on the street as we walk, visiting much loved cabins. We give thanks for music, for choir and for hearing our voices come together with the voices of others in a whole new sound. We give thanks for another year with our music director and pianist Arlene who has blessed us in ways too many to count. We give thanks for the recovery and ongoing health of some of our members, for Gwyneth, who continues to recover from a fall, from Gwen Cron, who continues to recover from heart surgery. We give thanks for the life and the well-being of these and others and for those who care for them. We speak now aloud in this place the other things for which we are grateful. Holy God, we raise prayers of concern to you as well. Concern because we live in a broken world, a world that in many places is virtually and literally being destroyed. We pray for the people in Ukraine, surrounding countries. We pray for people who have become refugees, for people that have spent long years in refugee camps already. We pray for the people of Afghanistan. We pray for those who are victims of sex trafficking, human trafficking, and we pray for their families. We pray for those families who have lost youth and young adults to suicide.
We pray for women and other marginal groups in the United States who are regularly seeing their rights rolled back in the law. We pray for courage everywhere. We pray for the ability to keep fighting for the rights that should be basic to us. And now aloud in this place, we speak the things for which we hold concern. Hear us now as we pray together the prayer of our hearts. Our Father, our Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn, We Are a Rainbow. Anything to say about this, Arlene? Our new song, We Stand to Sing.
receive the blessing. With courage that comes from being together, with hope of things yet unseen, and with love that sets us free, let us go from this place knowing that we are the church. May it be so. Amen. Thank you and uh, join us for lunch. <laughs>